So I'm going to tell you today about my favorite protein, which is P50C, as you know, of course. And uh, I would like to share with you some of our previous results and some of my visions and dreams which I have about P53. So um, my talk will be uh, like uh, three parts, four parts maybe. Short background, mm -hmm. uh, maybe you don't need a background here about P53 because you have such a great group working on P53, but just to remind you a bit about it. And then I will tell you about mutant P53 reactivating compound that uh, Gianni mentioned, Prima 1, and how it was it's, uh, developed to clinic. And about wild type reactivating compounds like Rita, which is not developed yet to, for a clinical trial, but it is a good tool to study P53, which we are using. And finally, I would like to share with you some ideas and some results of identification of P50C modulators or cofactors, which could be uh, targets for therapy for synergistic effects against cancer. Because you know that you cannot cure cancer with just one drug. You have to combine because cancer cells evolve so fast and they have resistance to uh, target, targeted therapy. So we have to think about this and to de design, rationally design combinations of drugs. So P50C is a transcription factor, you know that, which binds to the specific sequences in the genome, in the promoter of genes, and then when it is born, this facilitates the uh, uh, formation of transcription complex, which then activate gene or repress gene activity. And there are a number of target genes of P53. The list is growing. Some people say 600, some people say 1,000, some people say more, some people say 40. So it depends on the point of view and the stringency of your definition of P53 target gene. But anyhow, there are a number of genes which are involved in very important processes. And this is um, these processes are induced when P50C is activated. So when you, if you take a normal uh, skin cell that try to stain for P53, you don't see it because the levels at normal condition are very low. There is a basal activity of P53, which is very interesting what it does, but the major uh, activity of P53 comes when there is DNA damage or oncogene activation, hypoxia and so on, different types of stresses, which then protect <coughs> P53 from degradation by MDM2 and activate P53, which then can induce several transcription programs. It can induce growth arrest via CDK inhibitor P21, for example. It can induce DNA repair where several and antioxidant response where several target genes like cysteines or P48, 50CR2. And it can also induce a lot of target genes involved in apoptosis like Bax, Nox, Noxa, Puma, and uh, several others. And also has a very interesting uh, non uh, uh, autonomous cell defects on um, uh, anti angiogenic factors or like we recently discovered new targets of P53 which are ligands for NKG2D receptor in NK cells. So P53 can potentiate immune, immune cell mediated response against cancer as well. In addition to transactivation of genes, it can transrepress genes which are uh, several of them are anti-apoptotic genes and then finally it can be Trans, um, uh, converted to, to a direct mitochondria actin protein, which will uh, enhance the uh, poor forming activity of Bax and Bax and release cytochrome C in this way induce apoptosis. And I think group by Gianni has shown very interesting results about uh, mitochondrial function of P53. So P53 is a very potent inducer of growth arrest and apoptosis, as you can see from here. You can also look at P53 from the other side. So whenever you have activation of oncogenes, like RAS and MIG, deregulated to f beta catenin, they signal to P53 and induce P53. And unless the signaling from P53 to apoptosis is suppressed, P53 is going to kill cancer cell, pro-cancer cell, or cell which has a mutation in oncogene. So therefore, it's clear that the only tumor cells can survive and continue to proliferate, which will disable either the signaling of oncogenes to P53 or P53 itself, for example, by mutation, which occurs in 50% of tumors or even more, or you can also disable signaling downstream of P53. 
But of course, if you think about 50C target genes, there are at least several dozens of target genes. You mutate one and it will not have the same effect as disabling P53. Therefore, it's clear that it's uh, very beneficial for cancer cells to disable P53 signaling, P53C pathway. But in most cases, downstream of P53 genes are still intact. Therefore, it comes the idea that if you reconstitute P53 in these cancer cells, you will re restore this missing link between proapoptotic oncogenic signaling and apoptotic machinery and kill cancer cells in a specific way without uh, targeting normal cells. And this idea has been confirmed by several studies uh, in mouse models using, um, uh, for example, here Scott Lowe used uh, liver progenitor cells in which they knocked down P53 by TET regulatable shRNA. And then this uh, knockdown of P53 allows tumor formation in mice. And you can monitor the tumor formation because these um, uh, cells were also transfected with luciferase. So you can see induction of uh, hepatocellular carcinoma in mice, but if you knock, uh, uh, shut down this shRNA expression and P53C is induced, then you have re re regression of cancer. This was a very fantastic result for us and been confirmed in several other studies. And recently there were two more studies which show that P53 um, induced regression of highly aggressive metastatic tumors, but not early lesions. Some people took it as a kind of negative indication for P53 reconstitution in cancer, but we took it as a positive one because it's easy to handle early lesions. They are sensitive to chemotherapy. They are not genetically unstable. They are easy uh, to remove by surgery. But if you have metastatic tumor, aggressive tumor, that's, that's a problem. This is what patients are dying from, right? So if P53 can target even this aggressive cancers, metastatic cancer. That's the best, I think. But of course, we have to understand why aggressive cancers, but why not early lesions? There are a lot of things we have to understand about P53. But it's clear that most cancers have P53C pathway intact, and when you restore P53C, you kill cancer cells. Therefore, we are very actively working on two different directions, how you restore P53C function. Uh, it, of course, depends how P53 is inactivated. If it is mutated, uh, as we will see further, I will show you that the, the majority of mutations in P53 are missense mutations. is a small defect, one amino acid substitution, which makes P53 DNA binding domain, which is the center for P53 function because it's a transcription factor. So DNA binding domain is partially unfolded. So the idea is to stabilize the folding of DNA binding domain. And then you will restore or at least prevent maybe gain the function of mutant P53C or restore the function of wild type P53C. So we have uh, found the molecule which is called Prima 1 and then we developed it further. I will tell you a bit about this development later. And then this, in the second part, I will tell you about reactivation of wild type P53C. And the idea here is that P53C is uh, non mutated in 50% of tumors, but it's still non completely uh, functional because it is uh, inactivated by MDM2. And MDM2, the is the ubiquitin ligase, which degrades P53C, or MDMX, which is uh, inhibiting P53 transcription function. And there are several other inhibitors of P53C, but these are main inhibitors. And therefore, the idea is to prevent protein-protein interaction between P53C and MDM2, and to find these molecules. So we start with mutant P53C. As I mentioned, uh, the majority of mutations in P53C are missense mutations, shown in green. And this is a contrast to other tumor suppressors like APC in colon cancer, ETM, BRCA1, because the majority of them, yellow, are frame shifts. So you don't have a protein because it's a frame shift mutation. You lose it. Or it is uh, nonsense mutations, or it's uh, um, in-frame deletions, and so on. So you don't have the protein in cancer cells. But with P53C, with missense mutation, you still have a protein. And the missense mutations occur in DNA binding domain of P53. And these are the most uh, frequent mutations, so-called hotspot mutations. These three mutations occur in 20% of all cases with mutant P53. So there is a selection for specific types of mutations. And the majority of these mutations are 
leading to, as I mentioned, to partial unfolding of this domain. What I um, then summarize in this slide <laughs> that p 3 c mutations are very frequent in cancer. For example, in ovarian cancer, according to new gene sequencing data, it's 90%. And in uh, small cell lung cancer, it's even more than 90%. So there are cancers where it is mutated in almost all cases. And the majority are small defects, one amino acid substitution. The protein is present, and the mutations are in the core domain, and result in partial unfolding of the core domain. And then the, the advantage also of this approach is that mutant b 50 proteins are overexpressed in cancers as a rule. So you have a... Uh, Fundamental difference between normal cells and cancer cells. In normal cells, you have wild type P53C, which is expressed at low level. In cancer cells, you have mutated P53C, which is expressed at high level. And the defect is subtle. It's just partial unfolding. It's not a complete unfolding, because it's known that uh, many P53C mutants are temperature sensitive. If you express them in, in Bacula virus at 25 degrees, they have some activity at 25 degrees. So it's possible to re reverse this defect. So therefore, the strategy is to uh, restore the tumor suppression function of mutant P50C by stabilizing the folding of the DNA binding domain. So since I'm from, um, I want to show you this, uh, uh, the structure of P50C core domain. This is a DNA binding domain of P50C. And you can see that, you can appreciate it. It's a very complicated structure. So it's a, uh, beta sandwich, so there are several beta sheets which serve to properly orient these uh, two loops and alpha helix which contact DNA specifically. So you can imagine if you have a mutation somewhere here and uh, the loops are then looking in a different direction. So it cannot bind DNA. So if you can find something which will bind, for example, here and fix the beta sandwich, then you can probably prevent this un unfolding and restore the function of P50C. Since I'm from Moscow, I, I illustrate this in this way because this is a cathedral in Moscow, distorted, and then we put Prima 1, our molecule, and we have back a beautiful structure. <laughs> okay, so Prima 1 we found in a cell-based screen of chemical library at that time in 19... 1999, we started the screening. At that time, uh, the activity of these molecules in the NIH library was not very well known. And that was advantage for us, because now if you do the screen, the majority of compounds have been already tested in uh, cells, so you cannot patent the compound if you find it there. And this is a disadvantage for the further development, because it's inevitable that you will need money to do clinical trial and the money you can get for clinical trial only from venture capitalists and they will give you money on the, only on the condition that they will get, get a profit. And to get a profit, it should be protected. And to be protected, it should be patented. So th that's the kind of problem we have uh, here. If Unless the governments will do something and uh, allow us to develop compounds which are very good but could not be patented. I think governments should do that, but so far they haven't done that. So Prima 1 was patented by us in 2000 because it, oh sorry, it, it restores the uh, DNA binding activity of at least uh, 20 different mutants we studied so far. There was one exception uh, which made me very happy because uh, this was a mutant uh, which had a cysteine substitution and uh, three cysteines and one histidine form a tetramer which holds together zinc atom in the middle of the molecule. And this keeps beta sandwich stable. If you lose zinc, it's unfolded completely and you cannot restore it. So uh, cysteine mutants were not restored, but others were not re were restored. And then we showed that it rescues P53C conformation using conformation antibodies for P53C and induces hepatosis in tumor cells in vitro and in vivo. It's been published, they just to remind you, to show you the result here, when we injected in uh, SAUS2 cells, which are P50C null, in uh, skid mice, and SAUS2 cells expressing mutant P53, and then treat with uh, control PBS or with Prima1, then you can see that P50C <coughs> null cells do not react, but in P50C mutant cells, it's, there is a huge loss of tumor cells, and the majority of tissue see here is a connective tissue. You, don't, you really don't have cancer cells left. So that was a very good result, which allowed us to uh, go further with the development of this compound. And 
I'm very happy to report to you that we have completed clinical trial of uh, Prima 1 MET, which is the modified version of Prima 1, and the commercial name is APR246, and it's called APR because our company, which we started to develop this compound, is called APREA for advanced P53 reactivation. So uh, APRIA developed, did all these preclinical studies, toxicity, pharmacokinetics, and so on, so on, that we cannot do in the academic lab, but with my students, they want to have pub published papers, and you can't publish papers with this type of uh, work, but it is uh, required in order to go to patients. So they did everything, and then we were allowed to do phase one trial, <coughs> first in men phase one trial in hematological malignancies, like AML, CLL, or hormone refractory prostate cancer. It was just dose escalation study to see the highest feasible dose, to see pharmacokinetics, uh, toxicity, and things like that. It's not to show the effect, because we get um, for a phase one trial, of course, you never know, maybe your drug will be very, very toxic. Therefore, only terminally ill patients are recruited to this trial, and the life expectancy of these patients is three months. So therefore, we, we don't, and they failed all the drugs before. So you don't expect to have any cure. But actually, one patient he responded so well to Prima. We were really very happy because she had, um, in her, she had an AML, a young girl, and she had 80% uh, cancer cells in her blood. And after four injections of Prima, she had it down to 15. So we were really very happy and she had a blog and she wrote in her blog how she's happy that maybe she will see the spring and the flowers. It was in December. Unfortunately, it didn't happen because she died after bone marrow transplantation from host versus graft disease, which is a common problem. So, so we just to, to tell you how difficult these patients are. But uh, nevertheless, we, we had some good responses. Uh, here, uh, soon the result from two patients who had mutant P53C, because in this trial, we didn't recruit patients with mutant P53C. We took all the patients which came. And the two of them had mutant P53C. And this two, in these two, we had induction of Bax and Puma and Noxa, which are P53C target genes, which was really nice. And the other patients also, Bax, Noxa, and DR, uh, DCR4, R2. So this was their indication that it might be that indeed P53C is activated. So now there are uh, discussions about phase two trial, which is also very expensive, but um, we are very lucky at Karolinska because we have a special company called Karolinska Development AB, which is uh, uh, supporting financially startup companies. And they invested a lot in uh, our company and uh, and of course now they own 99% of it, but it doesn't matter, you know, it doesn't matter for us because it's not for money that we are doing this, it's for, we want to help people. So they are uh, going to invest in phase two trial, which is going to be in ovarian cancer patients and uh, it will be combination with cisplatinum in ovarian cancer. But some researchers were so much uh, impressed by our result that they asked us if it, they can do uh, their own clinical trials, so there is possibility that there will be a clinical trial in small cell lung cancer in Copenhagen, and maybe breast cancer in MD Anderson. So, but this is not clear yet. So, let's keep our fingers crossed that it will be a successful one. Um, so, to summarize what we had, it takes time to develop molecules to the clinic, and we are not still there. Still, it's will be several years, even, even if everything will be successful. So we uh, discovered Prima 1 in 2000, then preclinical development, mechanism of action, phase 1 trial in 2010, and now phase 2, proof of concept. And if everything good, in a few years we might have a phase 3 trial. But the phase 3 trial should be run then by Big Pharma, because they are specialists in phase 3 and it costs a lot of money. Yes. So now we are switching to Walter P53, and uh, the molecule we will be discussing is Rita and Natlin. Uh, in cancers, there are different types of 
uh, alterations and mutations which can lead to disabling of P53C signaling. And most of them converge on P53C MDM2 interaction, and uh, you know that MDM2 is a critical inhibitor of P53. There could be MDM2 amplifications, like in 30% of sarcomas. There could be an activation of P14R, inhibitor of MDM2. Could be an activation of kinases, which inhibit MDM2, like ATM, CHEC2, and P10. Or activation of kinases, which enhance is 3 ligase activity of MDM2 like AKT or overexpression of oncogenes which inhibit P14R. So there are many, many, many upstream uh, alterations which all converge on this interaction. So therefore it was just um, considered as a good strategy to prevent this interaction and in this way restore the function of wild type P53. And as you know, there is a very promising mo molecule, natlin which was developed by Hoffman Laroche, and this molecule resembles P53C peptide bond to MDM2. This is green MDM2, and this is P53C peptide, and this is natlin bond to MDM2. So it blocks, sterically blocks the binding site for P53C and MDM2, and um, probably you know that the, they've been clinical trials with natlin in AML and in osteosarcoma. Uh, this was, uh, th there was some toxicity, not very severe, but quite. Uh, with Prima, actually, I didn't mention that we also had some toxicity, which was mainly um, connected to central nervous system. There was uh, kind of confusion, dizziness, uh, loss of uh, orientation by patients, which was transient. With Natlin, there were different effects, if you nausea, um, quite, uh, the patient didn't feel very good, actually. But still, it's, it's possible to have these side effects. So probably they are preparing for phase two trial, but this is the big company and I don't know anything about the future. Maybe we will meet uh, Vasiliev in uh, Toronto in June and he will tell us about phase two. Let's see. So, uh, and our molecule is called Rita for reactivation of P53C induction of tumor cell apoptosis, but it's also the name of my sister, which is very nice because then, you know, when you discover something, you can give your name, <laughs> which is nice. So, Rita induces apoptosis in tumor cells in P53C dependent manner, and this is how it was discovered because we had a cell based screen of chemical library. We used HCT116 cells, which have wild type P53C and loss of ARF. So MDM2 is deregulated there. And then the same isogenic cell line in which P53C was knocked out. And then we were looking for compounds which will inhibit these cells, but not these cells. Okay, simple. So this is a molecule that we found. It's a very interesting molecule and we are very busy studying the mechanism of action and things like that. But the, the, why we, we are so interested? Because uh, it has a very good effect in vivo. This is one of the examples that was published a long time ago. These are colon cancer cells in skid mice. Uh, they were injected in the same mouse, and then IV injection of Rita, five days. And then we see, even with one milligram per kilogram, we see inhibition <coughs> of tumor growth in P53C dependent manner. Uh, and with 10 milligram per kilogram is even better. And since then, we did several more uh, xenograft studies with mutant P53C. Maybe you know that Rita, in addition to working on wild type, also works on mutant. I'm not going to talk about this today because it's a bit confusing and we still don't know the mechanism, how it does. But anyhow, in neuroblastoma, we tested this as a childhood tumor, which is very aggressive if it is not cured, if it is not reversed at the early age, and then it works there very well. So it's a very interesting molecule. And we would like to develop it also. However, before we go to clinic with this molecule, we have to remember that MDM2 is a major regulator of P53. And targeting MDM2, P53C interaction by many people is regarded as very, is not safe, quite dangerous. Why is that? Because, of course, when you don't have P53C in mouse, you get tumors. When you have three copies of P53 in super P53C mice uh, developed by Manuel Serrano in Madrid. Then you have tumor-free mice which have increased protection from carcinogen-induced tumors. But if you have 
constitutively activated. So in this case, it's three copies, genomic copies of p53. The background level of p53 is the same, but when you have stress, it's high level of p53 induction. And this gives the protection from carcinogens. However, if you have constitutively activated p53, which is a M mice uh, developed by Larry Dunhover. Actually, it was a mistake by mistake. They, they wanted to make transgenic mutant P50C mice. So they introduced mutant P50C in uh, cells, but something went wrong with recombination and they've got, instead of full length mutant P50C, they've got only C terminal parts, which correspond exactly to the uh, peptide, C terminal peptide, which we found uh, as P50C activator in the early studies. So in this mice, P50C is activated constitutively, and these mice die very early because of premature aging. Although they don't have cancer, they are very much protected from cancer. They die of, from aging. So too much P50C can induce aging. In addition to that, if you knock down MDM2, which is a prime uh, negative regulator of P53, you can't get alive mice. They die in utero. Okay? Then uh, Jared Evans decided because of P50C, because if you knock out P50C in, in this mice, they, they are okay. So P50C induces too much apoptosis in this mice when you don't have MDM2. Then Jared Evans made another model where he had P50C regulatable. It was uh, fused to estrogen receptor. And in the absence of ligand, estrogen receptor is uh, sequestered to cytoplasm by heat shock protein. So P50C fused to estrogen receptor in the absence of tamoxifen is in cytoplasm, cannot do anything as a transcription factor. When uh, the mice are given tamoxifen, P50C translocates to the <coughs> nucleus and then can induce its target genes. So they decided to test what happens if you reactivate P53 by genetic means in adult mice in the absence of MDM2. So they crossed MDM2 knockout mice with ER P53C mice, and they, they allowed them to grow in the absence of P53, and then they gave them tamoxifen in the drinking water. And what happens? In 24 hours, you have destruction of all tissues. They die, all of them. Horrible. So we have to remember then that complete inhibition of MDM2 is bad. You shouldn't do that, right? So we should understand how to keep precisely tuned level of P50C activity to prevent cancer, not induce aging, and so on and so on. So we have to be careful with P50C. And I like this idea of two phases of P50C, P50C healer and P50C killer. So what is P50C healer? P50C can induce checkpoints, which can allow DNA repair. It can induce antioxidant genes, and this will decrease the load of mutation, decrease ROS, and uh, this can prevent the cancer formation, as we know, and increase longevity. On the other hand, P50C killer, when you have already established cancer cell or oncogenic uh, uh, alterations, P50C induces pro-apoptotic genes, pro genes, senescent genes, which then stop uh, cancer growth or eliminate cancer cells. And this is very good for uh, uh, combating cancer. On the other hand, these two phases are not completely white and black, right? Because uh, this function of uh, induction of growth arrest could be very harmful because a lot of chemotherapeutic drugs works through P53, and then P53 induces growth arrest. They can stop, repair, and then continue to grow. On the other hand, induction of apoptosis by P53 contributes to side effects of therapy. That's why several researchers are now uh, developing inhibitors of P53. And pathological loss of cells upon ischemia, stroke, neurodegeneration, and even aging is also due to too much of P50C activity. So, everybody has a dream. My dream is to manipulate P50C so that you can use the healer and killer function only when you wish, when you desire them, and not in the cases where they have uh, these side effects and uh, bad, bad effects. 
So, in order to do that, we have to know how to manipulate P50C for a longer cancer-free life. That's a dream. I think all of P50C researchers share my dream, right? That's what we are working for. So, in essence, to manipulate P53 is to understand how P53C makes their choice between gross arrest and the knee repair and the pertussis. How does it decide what transcriptional response to induce or non-transcriptional response? In order to answer these questions, we use small molecules as their tools to address P53C biology. And um, in this case, uh, Rita and Natlin come very handy. So Natlin, as you remember, binds to MDM2 and inhibits P53C binding. And I'm not showing here, but we have data that Rita binds to P53C itself, induced allosteric uh, shift, which prevents MDM2 from binding. So these two molecules work on the same protein-protein interaction, but different targets. Nothing targets MDM2, Rita targets P53. And what is interesting is that these two molecules induce different outcome in the same cell lines. This we published a long time ago. This is a PI staining, so which shows you DNA content of cells. And upon Rita treatment, we induce sub G1 fraction, so the fraction of cells with a low amount of DNA, meaning that they are undergoing DNA fragmentation and apoptosis. In the same cells you treat with natlin, and you see this is the S phase cells, they are depleted. So natlin induces gross arrest, Rita induces apoptosis in a number of cell lines. So some people in P53C field, and um, uh, I think this idea is uh, completely correct, uh, suggest that the level of P53C dictates whether you induce apoptosis or gross arrest. For gross arrest you need low level, for apoptosis you need high level. However, if we test the level of read uh, induced P53C and natlin induced P53C, you see natlin induces more than Rita here. So it's not the level of P53C. So what is it? Um, one of the ideas which we uh, developed during this time is that uh, in addition to induction of proapoptotic genes upon Rita treatment, we also observed a very profound inhibition of several oncogenes. So when we did microarray analysis of Rita-treated cells, we saw inhibition of IGF receptor, which is a growth receptor, very important for AKT signal and many others, PS3 kinase, sub catalytic subunit MIG, AFOE, BCL2, MCL1, surviving, and so on. So a number of oncogenes are inhibited, and since cancer cells are addicted to these oncogenes because they are important for cancer cells to grow and to survive, maybe therefore they are dying because you have this profound inhibition of the set of oncogenes. So that's the idea we are currently investigating and uh, uh, we kind of confirmed it in the experiment when we combined natlin, which induces growth arrest, with the inhibition of MIC or MCL1. So when we used natlin, we have very few uh, dead cells, but if you combine it with CMIC inhibition, we have much more, and MCL1 inhibition, it's much more. It's a synergistic effect. So indeed, probably this repression plays a very important role in the apoptosis induction. So the scheme that we have is like this, and we have low dose of RIT or natlin. We induce proapoptotic target genes. They are induced for sure, with natlin and uh, low dose of Rita. But the apoptosis is not very efficient because you have pro-survival signaling which blocks the apoptosis downstream of P53. However, when you have higher dose of Rita, you have a profound inhibition, transcription repression of these genes, and also translation repression. And this then allows robust apoptosis to be induced. Right? So this is a nice scheme, but then the question is why? What is the mechanism? Are there some specific cofactors which are important for uh, this process? Probably yes. So then we wanted to find out what are these factors and we are doing a lot of different assays in order to find these modulators of P53 activity 
Kjo se më rejtë kje, vja duinë qipse, kanalisis ju nuë qipse, kisë dhe mepin of genome wide mapping of P50C binding to its promoters in cells. And microarray analysis, of course, combined with CHIPSEC. We also do a lot of uh, bioinformatics analysis and SHRNA screen to find out the synthetic lethality or resistance to our treatments. So, um, in a way, when we do CHIPSEC analysis, we ask a question whether P53 binds different genes upon different stimuli, or is it the same? And the question is whether P53 is it dumb or smart. So dumb P53 binds all the genes in the irrespective of the signal. If it is smart, then depending on the stress signal, it binds either cycle RS genes or apoptotic genes. In this scheme, you can see that it's more P53 needed to induce apoptotic genes, which we know not the case in our uh, model. So we think it's co-activators or whatever to help P53 to activate apoptotic genes. So what do you think? Is P53 dumb or smart? What is your guess? Come on. Smart. Me too. I also thought it's smart, but it's not. <laughs> so <laughs> maybe, maybe partially. But so we did chipsick analysis in uh, MCF7 cells treated with natlin and with Rita. Uh, and there were a lot of uh, binding sites of P53. When you look at them, they look different. But a lot of these binding sites are just noise. They are just ran random. When we increased the stringency and uh, took only high confidence peaks, it turned out that they are the same upon all three treatments. So that means P53 binds the same genes irrespective which signal is inducing P53. But the transcription response is different and biological outcome is different. So what is it? Then it should be cofactors, right? If the binding to promoters is the same, then it means that the cofactors which are present on the promoters either allow P53 to induce these genes or allow to repress or whatever. So it's not P53 which decides. In a way, it's P53 which decides it's maybe because if it is post-translationally modified, it's bound to the promoter, the same, but it's differently modified and therefore different cofactors can bind to it. Yes? In this way, it is a bit smart. It doesn't seem to be smart in, in terms of choosing the promoters, but maybe choosing cofactors, it's smart. Still, some hope, right? Um, which cofactors? So we analyzed the, the binding sites of PFRIS in the genome and then we uh, wanted to predict which transcription factors will bind together with P53. So which transcription factors will bind, will have their binding sites within P53 peak. And we had the predictions made using uh, uh, several uh, softwares from, uh, oh sorry, from GeneXplain, Transfax database, and then we also used uh, uh, our collaborators to to predict key regulators of P53 network. So I'm not going to go into details because there is no time, but I show, will show you the most striking result that we've got with the um, transcription factor, which is very surprising that we've got it, transcription factor, which is called um, SP1. SP1 is one of the first characterized transcription factors. It is ubiquitous, but what happens when you uh, knock down SP1 uh, these are the cells, I hope you can see that, treated with uh, natlin. Uh, it's not much happening. After several days, you will see large flat cells, which are senescent cells. After the treatment, uh, they are dying. But if you knock down SP1, it's much more alive cells, you can see. And if you do this in uh, fax analysis, you can see that upon uh, knockdown of um, uh, nothing, nothing happens. It's, it's the same response. But upon knockdown of Rita, there is a protection. And actually, we had SP1 as a knockdown as a protector from Rita induced apoptosis in our SHRNA screen, genome wide. So then we looked at the transcription response upon nothing knockdown. So these are microarray data that we've got. When we 
looked at the genes which are regulated by natlin but not regulated by rita so these are the genes uh, induced by natlin or repressed by natlin but not uh, regulated by rita and the same like in control so when we do sp1 knockdown and treat cells with rita you see they are clustered together with natlin profiles because the transcription response becomes natlin like so in the absence of SP1, there is a conversion of RITA-induced transcription response. And interesting is that there are several genes here shown, like MDM2, which is a P3 inhibitor, and NOTCH, which are activated by natlin. You can see here, these are target genes are known to be activated, but are not activated by RITA. But when you knock down SP1, they are activated. So SP1 prevents activation of several P53 inhibitors. And maybe that's why it helps to kill cells, because when P53 is induced, then it induces MDM2, MDM2 degrades P53. The same with notch, right? But if you prevent this negative feedback loops, then you enhance P53 response. And that's what we see, actually. We see that with natlin, we have transcription response, and then it goes down. And with it, it goes up and up and up and up until the cells die. So it's transient versus the sustained response. So maybe SP1 is involved in this. No, it may be, not maybe, but it is involved. And, but it is possible that there are several other cofactors. But of course, then it's in the next question. You know, you get some answer and then you get the next question. Why SP1 is uh, different upon Rita and upon Natlin? And so, so these are the questions that we are very busy with in the lab, trying to answer with different means. And uh, this is a scheme. Did I scare you with this scheme? Yes. Oh. <laughs> it's a lot of things that we are doing. We are doing a lot of microarrays. We are doing a lot of chip stacks. Recently, we have done uh, 82 chip stacks. We do uh, genome-wide HRNA screen, and it's all in order to find the modulators of P53 and keynotes. And why we want them? As I mentioned, we want to modulate P53, and in this case, we want to find targets which, when they are uh, targeted simultaneously to with P53 activation, will get syn synergy. Okay, and uh, actually we found several keynotes, and then uh, we had a project where we did the, uh, so, we did microanalysis on, on based on this, we predicted which uh, factors affect P3C response, prevent P3C induced apoptosis, and then we selected targets, and then we did virtual screen of 24 million compounds, which will inhibit these factors. And then we identified 64 hits, and then we validated them in cancer cells, and they in, uh, we did microarrays and patient samples and tumor xenografts. And finally, we are uh, left with two compounds, which are quite good. They synergize with P53, and even they have their own activity. One of them, ALAB1, this is a colon carcinoma xenograft, very good inhibition. And the second one, uh, no, this is the xenograft, you can see that 10 milligram per kilogram and 50 milligram per kilogram, very good inhibition of tumor mass. And the second compound, ALAP2, it in inhibits melanoma and neuroblastoma. This is very interesting, it's very specific. So we are working on these compounds to develop them uh, as a P53, helping P53 to kill cells. But maybe they will also work with other compounds. So this is a very interesting project. And finally, I would like to thank my group. This is the old picture because the, most of the data I showed to you was started by these people, Vera Grinkevich here, Martin Menge, Fyodor Nikulenkov, uh, Joanna, and others. So it's, I had a very, very talented students before and now as well. And my collaborators with uh, Gene Explain, which did uh, all the bioinformatics, and Vladimir Poroikov in Russia, who did this virtual screen of compounds. Thank you very much for your attention.